it's a difficult question to answer how I feel about it because my feelings have changed over and over again over the 50 years. Uh, you have to understand that, that when it happened, um, I was like 23 and Doug Brazil, the cameraman was 23. We were good friends. And, you know, I started at Channel 2 when I was still in college. And I was covering stories and on camera when I was still in college. And in 1968, I spent a week with every presidential candidate. I mean, I found myself sitting across the table from Governor Rockefeller and Tom McCall and uh, George Wallace and um, Robert Kennedy two weeks before he was shot. And so I was... I covered a prison riot in 1968. I produced a half hour special on it for Channel 2. And so when you're thrown into journalism in that way and life is exciting, the whale comes along and it's weird and it's different, but it was that day and then let's move on and see what else we can cover. And on the slow days, you're chasing crime scenes and, and fire trucks. So life was pretty exciting, pretty hectic and the, and the whale was a weird thing. And it took a while to realize that this thing was going to live on. And we were surprised because a reporter's mentality is don't ask me what I did yesterday. And um, so there, there were times in my life and, and you have to remember, I was asked about it virtually every day of my life or commented about it by everybody, strangers alike that, you know, I'd come out of Starbucks at 7 AM and say, uh, run into somebody say hey but nobody's mentioned the whale to you yet yeah the guy at the oregonian box an hour ago mentioned it to me you know and so that was life and there was definitely a time when i was sick of hearing about it but i got over it i wrote a book about it and i used the book to talk about other things that i was more excited about in journalism and so i ended up having an okay feeling about it and here 50 years later i find myself going yeah the whale you want to talk about it i can talk about it doesn't bother me <laughs> but my bottom line is most of us are long forgotten. Um, if I'm remembered only for the whale for a little bit longer than, than I'm around, then I, I guess that's a pretty good thing. It's just a, a smattering of people down there. It wasn't well publicized. <clears throat> so we went out there and of course it was mostly uh, ODOT crew that was out working on the beach, setting the charge and everything. Um, there wasn't, really a feeling of any kind of monumental event about to happen. Um, and then, of course, there was this explosion, uh, which littered the air for 100 feet with a whale blubber and um, spray that just smelled horrible. And then the one incident that maybe was more remarkable, of course, is the guy that got his car smashed by a piece of whale blubber the size of a dining table. <clears throat> Other than that, when we packed up and went back and then aired the story the next day, we pretty much put it in the can. Paul called ABC News, the weekend desk. This happened, on, we aired it on a Friday. He called the weekend desk back there and the guy, the producer said uh, he wasn't really interested in the story. And so we figured, okay, what the heck? And then Paul persevered and called the Sunday producer and he said, yes, send it out. Back in those days, she basically had to send it. And... Um, so we sent the thing out by plane to New York City, and on Sunday, they put it on the Sunday night evening news. And it was, yeah, okay, that's, that's interesting. And that was the end of it. And then in 1990, Dave Barry somehow heard about it, the columnist, and he wrote up about the fact that this sounded like the most unusual story he'd ever heard. Well, then it took grab, and people were calling us asking about the whale. And we got calls and letters from the Army Corps of Engineers from uh, the other TV stations, just everybody wanted to know about this. And of course, well, what? It's, it's, it's just a, you know, blowing up flesh. <laughs> so. You have to understand too, the, the nature of news at the time. I mean, it was Huntley Brinkley and Walter Cronkite and news was mostly serious. And occasionally there'd be a light story. Uh, a kicker story, but mostly we're doing an, a, an honest, straightforward reporting of the news. And so here I've got something really strange that's happened. I wanted to have fun with it, but I didn't want to make a joke out of it, nor did I want to uh, offend or insult the perpetrators, the Oregon Department of Transportation, and in particular, the assistant engineer who was in charge, George Thornton. Um, he thought he was doing a, a right thing. He thought 
um, he had it pinned down and he was, I found out much later, I didn't know this at the time, he was in direct consultation with the United States Navy that had done things like this in the past. And um, it turned out that the Navy said later, while well, he used a quarter of uh, a ton of dynamite or half ton of dynamite, it wasn't enough. And I always felt that, you know, ODOT was expert at blowing up rock surfaces and hard surfaces to make highways and whatnot. Here we've got a big blubbery whale on top of sand uh, over water. And most of that explosion, I think, tended to go down, not up. And I think it was factual that not enough dynamite was used, but I didn't want to make fun of him. And I didn't want to make him look bad. And then later on, and it's a whole other story, um, if you want to go there, I wanted to talk to him about it in greater detail years later, and he didn't want to talk to me. One of the anniversaries, I really wanted to get in touch with him and do another interview. And you'll love this. I, I went through ODOT and their public affairs people. And I said, would you please tell Mr. Thorne, I'd really love to talk to him. And I, I don't want to make this a negative thing. I want to make it a positive thing. And the response was, he said these words. No, every time I talk to the press, it seems to blow up in my face. <laughs> so I thought that was ironic. But I didn't talk to him. And he's since passed away. May, may he rest in peace. Doug, my, my partner, was operating a large sound camera, an Oricon 16-millimeter camera. And I was operating a 16-millimeter silent camera, a Bolex camera, um, to get slow motion of the same thing, which runs the film through the camera, as you know, much faster than normal. And so both of our eyes are behind viewfinders and this explosion happens and we stay behind the viewfinders until we hear things hitting the ground around us. And it was kind of a hollow thumping sound. It was kind of thump, 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 thump. And all of a sudden we realize that blubber is coming down and a little bit later moisture, which was blood and whale oil and all that. And Blubber is so dense that, you know, the, the tip of your finger, the, the half of a bullet size could go through the top of your head quite easily. And so Doug and I came out from behind the cameras, looked at each other. And at that point, another explosion took place behind us, which was the chunk that flattened the car about 100 yards behind us down the dune. So we both took our cameras and we started running in that direction to find out what the heck that was. And so there really wasn't enough time to be frightened. There was that momentary, oh, this stuff is landing and it could hit us. And then boom, the other one and you take off running and you keep doing your job. So it could have been horrendous. And I really don't think the thing would have lived on had somebody uh, been killed or there had been major injuries. I think it would have been, we wouldn't be talking about it today. And so happily, it didn't turn out that way. Uh, Walter Umenhofer had bought the car in Springfield, advertised as a whale of a sale, um, and a couple of days before. So he decided to drive down there. I don't think he knew about the whale being blown up, but he just drove down there to take his a new car out for a ride. And then he's also an Army demolitions expert. So he went down to the people on the beach, the ODOT folks, uh, and said, you know, this isn't like rocks and, and pavement and stuff. This is flesh, and it's a totally different kind of density. And you're talking about sand underneath it. They said you're using too much explosives. And they just, you know, okay, get out of here. Nice, nice talking to you, dude. And the next thing you know, it's his car that gets hit. I mean, that's just irony like you can't believe. Back in those days, and probably today too, the, the, you work as a team. The reporter and the photographer work as a team. So he, he's got a reporter's notepad and a, a pen. That's basically the instruments of his profession. I've got the camera, the tripod, the still camera, the amplifier, the battery packs, the lights, all that kind of stuff. That's part of my job. Well, so we go down, we charted the plane down there. It's a single engine airplane. There's hardly much room for any kind of stuff. and um, we loaded into the back of a, a loaner car that they had at the airport, which is how we got the stuff to the site. Once we got it to the site, we shot the story, we put the stuff back in the rental car. And by that time, we were covered with the blubber and the smell. And it was very disorienting. I mean, it was so bad and there's no way you could get rid of it. 
So we drive it to the airport. We start to get into the airplane. And of course, the pilot is just going, oh, my God. And he's got a the piper that we're in. Had to, they had to open a little pilot's window so he could get some kind of fresh air. And then we think we've loaded everything. We drive to Portland. We get out. We take everything out of the airplane and put it in the trunk of the news car. And we go, eh, we forgot the magazine in the car. I thought you had it, Paul. Paul says, I thought you had it, Doug. So there we are without it. Well, we got to the news director and said, um, he said, so what are you doing? We, we need the story on the air. And we said, well, we left the film down in Florence. He was not pleased. And that was Pat Wilkins. And uh, so he said, do whatever you can, but you're going to have that story on the air tomorrow night. We said, eh, okay. So I called the people down there that had this rental car at the Florence airport and said, any chance uh, you guys are coming up to Portland or something? It ended up his son or some relative was moving. And they said, we'll give it to him and you can meet him halfway up on I-5. So we did the next morning, got the film, brought it in, edited it and put it on the air. Everything was square with the news director. Here's the funny thing. So it was on film. And obviously the easy thing, the easiest thing to transport when people are asking about the video is to send them a, a copy of the tape. Well, we didn't have a copy of the tape on three quarters. So we ended up getting out of it. I think a guy at WFAA had a three quarter inch copy, which the quality was really poor. It was an air check. And that's the one we distributed to everyone that probably made the internet initially. And then you're looking back and, and I saw the Oregon Historical Society footage here just recently because they're doing an interview with us on Thursday. And um, I saw the 4K. They just had a couple strips of it. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, that is really crystal clear. 